Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, the last uh, conversation of today's convening. My name is Sarah Garten Stanley, and I'm co-founder for Spiderweb Show um, and the founding artistic director. And I'm so uh, happy to be in this uh, final conversation and to um, get an opportunity to filter through for my own self some of the um, uh, things that have been said already today. Um, some of the things that have st stuck in my mind, just to kick us off, are um, how the lack of time can be a real c contributor to um, bad science and bad art, which was a quote from somebody earlier, and I'm sorry, I can't, um, uh, I didn't write down who said it, but it reminds me, and thank you so much for the, the game that we just played, um, how important it is to breathe. Uh, we named this, um, and I'm not breathing while I'm saying it, <laughs> We named this, uh, this configuration, this, this day of experiment configuration as the, uh, the breathing circle because we felt that it um, could uh, emulate uh, a sense of contraction and release and contraction and release. So uh, I invite us for this last hour to, uh, to think about that and to speak, um, to speak slowly, uh, whether you're part of the inner circle or um, if you come in in the number two circle or the final circle. Of course, I say that and then, um, and then remind uh, all of you, thank you so much for joining us in this circle, that I'm going to put a two-minute timer <laughs> on each of your um, opening remarks just to um, help organize the conversation moving forward um, so we can stay in the inner circle and have some, um, some good, uh, fulsome conversation back and forth. Um, I, I'm also really struck by a, a comment that, uh, that was made earlier a couple of times about innovation inflation. And I'm thinking about how in, um, in this topic, this conversation is titled uh, Digital Utopias, um, how utopia is a suspicious word for I think a lot of reasons because um, the promise of, um, uh, of technology and the internet and accessibility and any number of things that were thought to be potential equalizers and or to bring in the word that was uh, called into question this morning, disruptions. Um, while we've seen a lot of, I think, really exciting changes and things occur, um, I think we've also seen some things that have not been as exciting. And so the word is, is not necessarily a, a wholly beloved word, but I think it's an interesting word to think about how we might be optimistic um, if we use utopias in that way uh, when we think about um, the digital interface with utopia. But also, it comes out of um, our initial thinking around sustainability. And, uh, and in many side conversations I've had throughout the day, what has come up are these questions around uh, the climate that we are uh, existing within, the advent of climate change, the planet that we, um, that we are a part of, um, and how we're coexisting um, on the lands that we are on, but, but as well with all of the flora and fauna that we're trying to uh, understand how better to coexist with. And so I think there is a real digital kind of imprint um, that is hidden in the same way that our own power over many other animals, plants, and, um, and weather systems was hidden. So I bring that just forward as something to, to think about moving forward. So, um, for this last conversation, um, it's going to be uh, two minutes uh, time for each of the speakers. I, I remind you, and I would ask that we do employ when we are talking, and this is for the whole group, this is my final thought. Uh, it will make it um, uh, more widely accessible to all people involved um, and helpful just in terms of uh, the moderating as we go through. And um, uh, I, I didn't ask a, a particular uh, leaping off order, but I did hand a microphone to Sage, and I was wondering if you'd be... Um, Okay to start. Sure. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm waiting for the timer to start already. <laughs> Breathe. Um, so I'm really interested, uh, folks, hi, I'm Sage Crump. I've introduced myself a couple of times. But what I do with complex movements, I'm, I'm a cultural strategist. And so what that means is I think a lot about the ways in which um, art and culture dismantles systemic oppressions and creates the world we want to live in. And so inside our collective, um, uh, we think about all the ways in which the work is designed to do that. That is both the artistic uh, work and how it moves and supports different organizing and communities, but it's also like the conjuncture in which it finds itself. Who are, who are our presenters? What communities are we going to? How do we get to them? And so uh, I share that by way of entering into this conversation around digital utopia, because I think a lot about 
um, um, how we get where we're going and the importance of thinking through that with a level of rigor to ensure that we're not replicating systems uh, and not replicating systems that devalue, exploit, uh, um, especially as touring artists, um, creating extractive economies in the places where we go. Um, and I, I, I'm glad you kind of called on me first because I do want to talk about utopia. This idea that there's somewhere we're going to land, I think is antithetical to um, a creative practice. Right? Um, I like to think about um, um, the work of Octavia Butler and in her book, Parable of the Sower, she talks about all that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only constant is change. And so utopia implies we're going to land somewhere to me. And I think what I'm, I'm more interested in is um, how do we build um, ways in which we, are, we continue to be iterative, creative, and anti-fragile. Um, so it's not just in relationship to the challenges, but that we are in, in a constant mode of learning, a culture of inquiry, building a new way of being. Um, I think that, uh, oh, I lost my other thought, um, that that helps us um, think about the tools that we use. Um, when we're clear about where we're getting or what we are working through, then, then the tools come in in ways to get there. And we can also think about what is the, the right technology and how it is used. Um, the, um, yeah, I think that maybe where I, that might be my final thought. I got a lot more thoughts, but they're, they're gonna come a little later. Wonderful, thanks so much, and we'll come back. That was two minutes exactly. Just to do a little bit of around the circle and placement, um, I called these placement statements and just asked each of the speakers to think about where they're coming at this question from and where they're hoping to look ahead to the future. So just so, so we'd place everyone, um, uh, right across uh, from me um, is, um, is Sage, and then to Sage's right is Abigail, and to Abigail's right is Kevin, and to Kevin's right is Alex. Alex, I'm to your right, and to my right is Chantal, and to Chantal's right is Wesley. And um, I'd just like to pass it now to Abigail. Hi, I'm Abigail Vega. I'm the producer of the Latinx Theater Commons, LTC, um, which is a flagship program of HowlRound. Uh, a literacy moment for maybe some of my Canadian friends and also U.S. friends. Um, so uh, Latinx is not an English or a Spanish word. It is a gender-inclusive uh, word for people who are Latino or who are Latina or who are Latinx. And that's, in the United States, defined as um, somebody who was born in the U.S. or lives in the U.S. of Latin American descent. So that's kind of what we're using. Although I'm now hearing that Canadians are using it, which is awesome, and um, very excited about that. Um, just for context, we're the uh, second largest minority in the United States, the fastest growing, a quarter of school children in K through 12 are Latinx. And um, an interesting thing when we talk about sort of conversations around generations is that the average white person in the United States is 48, the average Latinx person is 28. So there's like, yeah, there's some major shifts going on, and um, a lot of that has to do with, with generation as well. Um, so we are an, uh, a hemispheric national movement of scholars, advocates, um, administrators, and art makers who are kind of looking to rework the quote American theater. And we're going to be inclusive and say America, right? The whole America. Um, uh, we do that by producing conversations and events via convenings. We publish on the HowlRound Journal. Um, and we are across four time zones in the United States and in Canada with our volunteer steering committee of about 60 people and 35 advisory committee members. Um, and we do everything, aside from the producer position, everything with volunteer labor. We are not um, inventing this wheel. Um, we are only riding on the, on the shoulders of our ancestors. So earlier someone talked about like disruption being like, oh, we're, we're sort of like redo Doing it, and and that's not what we're doing. We're we're relying on the fact that um, in in our community we have a long history of um, of organizing, and this is just the next step. And there will be something after us that's even better. And and then that's what I'm. When we're thinking about utopias, I, I also don't like the idea of landing in a place because we can't even envision what paradise looks like yet. Um, but but I'm interested in what happens after us and being okay with things ending, people, because sometimes things have to end. Thanks so much. Right on the two minutes. Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin, uh, Three-Legged Dog in New York. Um, so it's been interesting listening to, um, especially the, the, our attempts to grapple with interactivity Kevin, today. Kevin, yeah, Kevin, sure. Um, but I just, uh, just one sort of utopian statement as an, uh, as an art maker. Um, a lot of times we think of code at 3LD 
as a universal translator between modes of, express, uh, modes of expression. And I talked a little bit earlier about how the biggest sort of impact of technology um, on our work has been its ability to integrate all the different aspects of a performance or installation. And so um, as, an, as an artist, I've been working for the last 23 years to try to find a way to allow myself and other artists to build and finish large-scale ambitious <laughs> projects, <laughs> um, you know, many of which use uh, technology. And also to find and uh, put forward technologies and methods that are affordable and usable by your everyday average Joe or Jill artist. So, um, and with, you know, uh, this sort of up and down success. Um, <laughs> so probably the biggest, um, the biggest struggle has been uh, that our company has ended up um, doing as much experimentation in business modeling as it has in art artistic uh, experimentation just to try to keep moving, right? In fact, in January, we, we finally were forced out of our 12,000 square foot space in Manhattan. We're the 90th performing group to be, have been forced out since the recession. That's a whole other discussion, and it's not utopian. It's quite dystopian, actually, and all, I think all of us are experiencing it. But um, as an artist, um, what I've been working on, I guess, really uh, in a focused way since 2005, is to try to find ways to bring um, moving image or uh, cinematic imagery into um, uh, into the into the living in the live space. So the the beauty and the and the and the scale of cinematic imagery um, working with the immediacy and unpredictability of live uh, performance, and that that does have a lot to do with interactivity. We have to find systems that allow. Uh, our performers to interact um, and improvise inside a digitally complex place, and we've had a lot of success with that. Thanks so much. We're, we're actually sure. yeah. Um, uh, Alex, I'm gonna. There's a mic coming to you on your. Can you put the mic to my computer, please? Make sure this works. Digital is open. This is Alex speaking. Is that loud enough? Not really, is it? Uh, keep keep going. I'll see if I can turn. This is Alex speaking. 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 You can hear that? Can you hear that at all through the speaker? Yeah. Oh, the speaker's up there. Yeah. This is Alex speaking. This is Alex speaking. Okay, I'll keep going. Digital utopias. For me, these two words provoke quite an emotional response, colon. Fear, frustration, anger, hope, isolation, breathing and not breathing. Other significant themes come to mind, colon. Choice, reliability, balance, politics, access, human performance, unfashion-initiated perceptual intelligence. Digital utopia? When the technology delivers equitable opportunity. At present, I propose it is of greatest benefit to those who are more entitled. Be it more able, more economically stable, more likely to be employed, to just name a few. I also propose that there are many who have limited access to meaningful digital engagement and could benefit greatly from it. And as such, there exists a need for advanced political will and political progress to keep up with digital opportunities. Perhaps this is called political digital utopia. I experience the lack of political progress in relation to digital progress every day. I also have the privilege of being a working artist with access to funding, which has enabled me to find creative solutions to access, find an artistic voice within this, and invite digital technology into my work. With the protection of being part of a thoughtful artistic process, Digital technology outside of an artistic process often leaves me feeling a disconnect with my body. Sensorially understimulated, fragile. Digital utopia? Blank. When we continue to question how it is or is not liberating our imagination, our access to quality of life, and work, our connections with each other and the living world around. End of current thought. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, do you want to make any more comments at this point? Or that was jostling into current thought, yes? Sorry, I was looking at you, Alex. That's Sorry, what? Is that the end of your current thought? That was, I even said that. I, <laughs> wonderful. Paul. End of current thought. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm going to pass it over to Chantal. 
Um, so my most direct uh, relationship with technology is through a uh, project that I co-founded in 2015 called Climate Change Theater Action, where every two years we commission uh, 50 playwrights from around the world to write a short play um, related to climate change. And then we take this collection of plays and we make them available to whoever wants to present an event um, within a certain time window in the fall against ar around the world. So the way we use technology for this is really to uh, create a sense of community um, and, and uh, make visible something that might not be visible and give people a sense that they're having an impact even though they might feel very isolated. So we have a, a little bit like HowlRound, we have a world map where we pin all of the events that are taking place and then we use social media to put people in touch with each other. So what ends up happening is um, somebody, so this is an arts-based um, action uh, for social change, and people use these plays, they create an event, and it might be a small group in Kenya, let's say, that's um, presenting an event for 20 people, but then they know that uh, within that si same time frame, um, in the same uh, about 12 weeks, that there are hundred, hundreds of other events taking place in the world with thousands more audiences. And so what feels like very, could be a very small thing that you know, if you are on your own, you may not notice any impact. And when you, when you see that it's replicated, um, it's much more encouraging. And of course, it's nothing new. It's what a lot of organizers are doing, a lot of social movements are doing. Um, but we've kind of borrowed this uh, model and applied it to um, the arts. Is that it? <laughs> if you're done, yeah. yeah. Is that your, the end of your current thought? I think that's the end of my current thought. Wonderful, thank you. Wesley. Um, so, yeah, Wesley Taylor, part of Complex Movements with Sage. Um, so many different conflicting thoughts about like the idea of utopia that don't like I can't even reconcile in my brain right now. Um, and I think one thing that I grapple with on a daily basis of um, like not being resigned to the ship already sailing. Um, on these things never being achieved, and it's like, well, what do you do in the meantime? Um, when I was 18, I studied like as a, I started my university years as a in environmental sciences. I left that to be an artist because like all the models that I saw in 1996 were like, it's over if we didn't do things 10 years ago, um, and those were those were the models. Like we will be out of this if. This accord is not assigned, is not signed on to and agreed to, then it's over. And these were all the predictions 30 years into the future, 50 years in the future. And if there was a checklist and we we're supposed to check those things off, then none of those things were checked off. Um, so like that's one thing, but then thinking about like other things, like I'm obsessed with AI, right? Um, and just thinking about where the, the ship is sailed with that. Um, and Going back to like theorization of and lived experience of, we talk about utopia, and I think utopias can be conflated with this idea of fiction and science fiction and dystopia and things like that. And so my technology word was Skynet, and it wasn't as a joke, but I actually that is what I think. Um, and that is why I'm obsessed with artificial intelligence. Um, but also like the theorization of say the like the black body in the United States already experiences that dystopic notion that is in science fiction. Um, and so those are things that are like I grapple with all the time. So just to say that I am engaged and involved with these things, because to me it go, comes down to like the consciousness and what is the consciousness that is imbued in these systems, ideas, frameworks, technologies, and on a wholesale like way, there's it's very much exclusionary. And so what goes on, what transports, what transfers to next phases and next stages of humanity and things um, keep me up at night. Thanks so much. Um, so thanks everyone for a, sort of a two minute kind of placement statement.
Um, what, I, what I heard in, in three different um, ways, and actually not the word, but uh, in, from everybody, was this question about fragility. And I wonder how, uh, Sage, you mentioned it with respect to um, anti-fragile. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. And then, uh, Alex, it came up, uh, the word fragility came up in, in, um, in your writing. And, uh, and then, Kevin, you spoke about sort of building and finishing, and there was sort of a concrete kind of, you know, uh, get this thing kind of built, and and Wesley, when you sort of mentioned this this question around um, if the, if there's a checklist, then it didn't get. Ch so I just I, I, I everybody actually sort of brought it in. So I, I wonder if we could sort of spend a bit of time on that. Sure. Um, so first of all, there's a book called Anti Fragile. I don't actually recommend the book, but conceptually, it's really dope. <laughs> um, and um, part of it is a way to move past the, this thought of like resiliency. And the, this um, and resilient meaning something that comes something that comes against you, and then you are able to respond and recover. Um, building spaces that are anti-fragile means you are in a sense you are in a, um, a process of constant iteration. So it's not a, a, a responding to an external. Um, uh, um, disaster or an external problem, but actually we're building things that move us past, the, and, it, and it moves us past this, uh, what I kept hearing is like this binary of dystopia, utopia. Anti-fragile gets us into this constant, um, um, creates a different culture by which um, we're, we're not centering um, the, the harm, but we are, are, are continually thinking about our vision forward and, and what's the future iteration from the learning from what's happened. So the first time I remember hearing the words uh, sustainable um, and viable um, were from a venture capitalist in the early 90s who was describing what was wrong with not-for-profit organizations. Right? So I, I try, I, th and this is a problem that, that I think is common to everybody that's working in digital arts, which is that there's a pervasive corporate uh, structure uh, that we all run into moment to moment every day. And one of the things I, um, that I'm, I'm interested in, we started a software company because there wasn't a tool that we needed. So we just started a software company and it put us in the same room with Henry Kravitz, the inventor of the hostile leverage buyout. So it wasn't that good an idea, it turned out. But, um, uh, and I learned a lot from him, unfortunately. But um, but uh, sorry, can you say what that yeah. is? The uh, hostile leverage buyout. That's that's where the investor comes in and get and takes usually half equity and half uh, debt, and then they do what they call fry and flip, which is they push the the entity to spend as much money as it can until they're in trouble. Then they call in the debt and own the company. So I mean that's one way. There's Thank a you. lot of different other. It's Thank hostile you. and it's leveraged. It's bad. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, one of the one of the issues that we struggle with, you know, we work really hard at Three Legged Dog to make sure that our tool set is affordable, that other that any artist anybody can can have access to it. You know, we uh, we did a big huge uh, installation in Shanghai that was probably the largest video projection surface ever built at that time. It was 88 million pixels, so it was five times IMAX resolution, and we did that with 350 dollars software. Because that's it's better. It's a better tool, and and it's also we can't afford forty thousand dollar channel media servers, right? So, uh, so that's part of our that's part of our our, our work. And the last ten years, um, I've found it more and more and more difficult to engage artists in cooperative work because everybody is innately pitted against each other by this ridiculous idea that we're going to achieve something by competing with each other somehow, right? So this is another sort of struggle that I've had, and not all artists, you know, but you know, we've been able to have, make a lot of progress through cooperative action. But, um, but one of the th things I'd like to see, for example, is a group of artists and technologists and maybe universities are involved that come in and develop an alternative to the Adobe suite, you know, <laughs> which I feel like a, you know, a, like a, a indentured servant, you know, to Adobe because I have to use their suite and I have to pay X amount of money a month to make sure that my content, my intellectual property, is still accessible to me. You know, um, I guess I feel more like I'm kidnapped. But um, anyway, great, thanks. I, I, um, 
I think we could sort of move move on maybe a little bit from that question. I'm, I'm curious a little bit about uh, the feelings around data and how data is providing um, positive um, opportunities for the work that you're doing and how it may or may not be uh, helping the work that you're doing. Um, I was uh, thinking in the previous session about this question about whether audiences want to participate or not, and it made me think about how suspicious uh, I feel about data, um, but also how dependent upon data I am. And so I'm, um, Abigail is really um, moved by the quote with respect to uh, the average uh, white person is 48 and Latinx is, um, my writing's terrible, 28. 28. Yeah, and I mean, that's an incredible statistic, and it's, and it's based on data, which I think is, from my perspective, a very positive uh, outcome of what data can do, or the work, uh, Chantal, that you've been able to do with respect to climate change and, and, and bringing together um, uh, for, for social change, and yet I wonder, my question to the group is how we feel uh, having this data is helping move our, our projects forward. Uh, do we see that being a continuum, or do we see the problems that uh, lie ahead? Anyone want to take that on? Well, I'll just say something that's, you know, super U.S. for a moment. But um, so I was reading this this article that was talking about how all the, 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 the rules that the EU is putting in about security in relation to our data and how um, the U.S. isn't doing that work. And it equated that, um, you know, Europeans feel about the word privacy the same way that Americans or United States seems to feel about the word liberty. <laughs> like, we are, like, all about freedom and liberty. Like, it's, it's like, it's like so, so privacy is not the same. So I am almost like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like, data, I feel like, whatever. <laughs> um, in some ways, you know, it's unreliable because uh, when you're talking across labels, you know, specifically for Latinx people, right? So we are white, we are black, we are indigenous, we are Asian. And most often when we're talking about census work, like that happens every 10 years in the United States, they don't include Afro-Latinx people in that number. So when I say a quarter of, that's not happening. There's also a lot of, um, specifically in the Southwest, people are being mislabeled as Latinx when they're really indigenous or Native American. So there's all these like labeling things that, that are really weird, um, I guess here too, but definitely in the US. Um, that, 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 that do pit us against each other, right? So it's like if it becomes about, well, only one can get it, and we're gonna be in the same pool, like then we have a, we have a moment of competition that's false, and that's created for no reason. Um, but, but it can also build strength, right, in terms of community and, and having a greater sense of the numbers of uh, a larger sense of, you know, across a nation or mm -hmm. across the America, or Americas, or Turtle Island, as you said, you know, it can, it can offer an opportunity to, to think in a, in a larger, more communal way. Yeah. Um, I guess the question is, can that communal thinking translate, and maybe that's my end game thinking, which may be um, sort of part of this utopian um, uh, problem, but can it help transition uh, into greater power for different groups who have not up till now held the balance of power, and can are, are we still in a position where um, this work that we're doing can uh, make uh, strong, do we feel that we can still make strong cultural change with uh, the use of technology and the digital shift? Is it still something that is a, something that we feel that anybody here that I feel positive about um, and can point to some of the ways in which it can really um, uh, help move ideas forward? So I made a, I did a little experiment with data and this was not data that was collected um, through technologies, just things I knew from this project, Climate Change Theater Action, and it was um, looking at uh, racial bias and gender bias and comparing our statistics with the field at large. And I would say, so, um, the, because in the field at large you have, you know, usually um, artistic directors in institutions making decisions about their programming, and then in Climate Change Theater Action it tends to be either individuals or um, groups who will come together and make those decisions. So the decision power, it lives in a different place and I, I wanted to see if um, it affected the place that were presented, whether um, our statistics in terms of gender and, and race match the statistics of the field at large and it turns out that it didn't, that we were doing much better. So. I th and w you know, and when I say we, it's not me, it's really the people who participate. So I think in that sense, the data is a way to move the field forward because then it makes you question, okay, 
where does the power live and why when it lives there are certain decisions made in a certain way? And so if you change how where the power lives and the decisions are different, then what does that mean and what do we have to reconsider? Alex, would you like to say something? Yeah, I want to just clear everything. Is this, is this a question about data or just the, the digital, the potential for digital uh, technology to advance ideas? Is it, is it it's, it's both. I both, was yeah. It's about data. But okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I have to say uh, the, the subject of data doesn't speak to me. I, I'm trying to get sort of a, a connection to it, both personally and profession professionally, and I'm, I'm struggling. But... I can certainly say that um, that that digital technology has changed the way that I imagine, and it's changed the way I decenter vision from work. So I think, um, in answer to your question, in just in terms of progression of ideas, I, d I do think that I, I, I think it does progress. I think it changes how we how we imagine and then how we execute those imaginings. Um, but I'm I'm a bit confused about the, the question of da data. Could, could you? I, I can, and then and then I and then after that we're going to move into the second circle, and then hopefully we can keep the conversation going. Um, uh, an example of that is uh, recently um, we were doing some work into to climate change and some of the data uh, around the carbon footprint that um, exists as a result of uh, technology where we think of it as a very clean, um, non-pervasive um, uh, non or invasive kind of um, way to uh, communicate that in fact there's many questions around how much, how, much uh, how large the carbon footprint is using te technological um, um, you know, email instead of paper, for example, is a very straight up thing. There's a, there is actually data can show the costs. And so to my mind, that's a very helpful, really, really productive way to think about because we make so, so often we'll make big choices and then look back and go, oh, oh, maybe that wasn't the best choice. So it was from that perspective thinking okay. there might be some stuff. Thank, um, you. thank you. If we can maybe take this moment just to move to the second circle and please feel free to join us um, in the second circle. Okay, um, please, as I say, feel free to join from uh, outside the circle. Um, but let's keep going on this question. I think, um, Sage, it looked, oh, Wesley. Yeah. Did you want to say something? You go first. Okay. Um, so I think another thing, so it's like all my allergies, I have a ton of like food allergies, right? And then I have a lot of like, a lot of word allergies. Um, Cause I think data, like, I feel like I, there's a lot of, for me, resistance to like this idea of, data because of, I think, um, like a lot of positions that I like to take are anti, like, anti-modernist enlightenment, um, objectivized and like objective thought. Um, because like a lot, of those th a lot of those things and those concepts become instrumentalized against communities that see the brunt end of those, like the, the worst end of those things. Um, and so it's like these are things that I understand and I know like data can show things, but then it's also like, it's also data over intuition a lot of times. And it's like a lot of times where it's like, you see, I can like, I can do like a lot of math just reading a lot of reports, um, say articles and things like that. And you're like, well, you know, this is fucked up, it's not right. And then it takes another 30 years for data to support that. You know what I mean? And that's where we go with when you have people yelling to say, mm -hmm. this is not right, this is my experience, this is my lived experience. I can, and so I think one very good example of that is video on cell phones and police brutality. People have been screaming, police brutality exists. But until like the objective thing of like, 
cameras and those things being broadcasted through technology, do people like understand this as a thing? Um, and so I think that's one um, anecdotal way. And once again, it's like data over antidote, right? Antidote becomes a bad word when we start to talk about evidence. Um, and so just rethinking some of these things in a lot of ways. I mean, it makes, it makes me think about rethinking the, the, the greater systems when we're thinking about climate change, when we're thinking about colonization, when we're thinking about the ways in which we've uh, created our systems for engagement, that it's hard at a certain point to, un to sort of uh, talk about anything without starting to undo a lot of the things which has to do with monetary systems and the way in which we think about end results and, um, and uh, kind of a financial um, bottom line um, often is a, is a leveler. So um, I'm wondering if there's... Uh, Sage, were you gonna? Yeah, I'll jump into this 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 data uh, question a little bit because I was having a very similar uh, reaction. Al Alex, yes. yeah, um, about like how am I leaning into this question? And part of it for me was this idea of like the the word data and like separating this idea of data and statistics first of all, and thinking about what are artifacts of a lived experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that can do by um, understanding. Um, um, Understanding what are our it shows us our connections, right? That it, and and it helps it can help us build relationship. And for me, that's where um, the value of looking at the pieces of a thing and saying these pieces are aligned here and with this other person, and how we can get to things like intersectionality or or even a conjuncture that makes sense around building a new political climate. Um, the other thing that I, I want to come back to my other thought when you were talking about. Um, this relationship of this conversation to climate justice. During lunch, I was talking with one of the volunteers about um, a, a black feminist writer named Sylvia Winter and her piece, Beyond Humanism. And one of the things she advances in that is that um, we can't only talk about the well-being of humanity, and we have to move beyond humanism because we are in relationship to everything around us. And I think we think about a relationship, and I'm looking for someone who... Here's my friend here, who was talking about relationship earlier um, around the inter during the interactive and immersive conversation. Um, that all of this is for me is a lot is around um, how do we build more touch? How do we build more touch with each other? And that it's in the the touch and the collectivity um, that we'll actually figure out what is next and what needs to be next. Which is sort of anti data. Right, if we're going to rely on like the porous structures, you were talking about self, no, co, co-presence, like if we're going to rely on that as our primary data as opposed to numbers and all those kinds of things, like that's kind of a radical anti-data perspective a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not arguing for it. I, I have one example of it being positive, which was uh, around thinking about climate change from, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think... Um, but I want to pick up on this thing about touch uh, because we're we're all here. We get to be in in space together, which I think is a tremendous privilege to be able to gather and to make the most of being in the same space as one another. We've all come together uh, over great distance and have communicated uh, previously over uh, online and on the internet and and over di different communications of device or different devices, um, are we thinking about how touch can be more a part of future thinking around technology and how it can be more expressive? And is that something that is a, um, because when I think about VR, um, uh, if, if you can't see it, you could hear it, but you can't, you, you can't be fully engaged in that. And I'm wondering, are there going, are, are, does anyone here know any, anything about that does any touch work around um, sort of multi-layered experiences that have a, a physical, um, uh, component, because I think touch is hugely important, but Alex. Yeah, there, this is Alex speaking. Um, haptic technology is, uh, is you know, vibrational um, information. That you, so I did a theater piece in England that uh, the audience was led purely through um, a haptic device that, they, that was in their hands. And so um, it, it, was, it was highly interactive in, in terms of touch. Um, it was very interesting, but again, I guess one of the things that I, thinking about touch and, and about the balance between um, digital technologies and the human experience, whether it be touch or smell or hearing or seeing, is that 
so often the technologies actually can um, interfere with uh, the human technology. So if I'm wandering around a space with um, uh, a haptic in one hand and a cane in another, there are no hands free for me to use that, this wonderful piece of technology called my, my skin. <laughs> and it's the same often with um, you know, uh, technologies that, uh, that are for blind people where y you have to, in order to use it on the street, you have to put in earbuds because you can't possibly hear it on your phone. And once you put something in your earbuds, <laughs> it's like, I don't know what's going on over there anymore. So I'm really interested in technologies that use bone density or um, some way, like something not in the hands, but just some way to, to protect our, our, our human perceptual intelligence with technology intelligence, technological, digital intelligence. End of current thought. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just um, wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of in an instance like VR, what kind of data might be collected and that in many instances that data could be something like the haptic feedback of the person who's standing next to you, the warmth coming off of their body and how that narratively fits in with what you're experiencing in virtual space. That data isn't necessarily collected or put into any kind of record keeping, but is nonetheless part of that experience. And I think this idea of haptic feedback is a huge part of the immersive qualities of a lot of these technologies that we've been talking about all day. Um, and that a lot of these issues of data that we've talked about, it's, it's kind of about how they become fixed in time and space, about how a record that was taken from a while ago gets looked back on and then we comment on it as if it is a truth of today. Um, and yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to speak to this um, piece about touch and also connect it to what you said earlier about intuition, because I think that we have a serious problem underlying how we think you can translate between experience and basically math. I think we have a, a theory, like underlying our, we have this understanding that the universe can be well understood through math, which is very true, but that translation is really f deeply flawed. And so what that means, like how are we going to take these things that are very complex and translate them into data that actually gives us meaningful information about the people we're putting into these systems is something that we're not very good at doing. And I think that's really a serious risk when we move forward with technologies, because if you start saying we're gonna count features or count things about people, and we don't really know fully how to use that information effectively, but then we're gonna build our systems based on our imperfect use of that data. That's when you start getting these problems like these social media problems, right? You, you have ideas um, that have some use, but also deep flaws, and then you set up the structures and put people in them. And I think that that pattern, and that's actually a thinking problem of, okay, well, we're taking this information, we're imperfectly translating it, then we're building ideas based on that, then we're building systems based on that. That, that set of sequences is a huge danger in doing this work and in building and in building systems that we're going to use these technologies within. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that when I'm curious about using the term touch and data in the same conversation. And I'm curious about how we're considering the, the ways in which our data is already um, touching back on us via the way it's being collected and mined and um, uh, coming back and, and weaponized uh, to identify ourselves to ourselves um, as, uh, as mediated bodies. And I'm uh, curious about, uh, in a conversation about digital utopias, how we can start to like unpack the ways in which um, the ways in which our data is already uh, has already been proliferated on online platforms and different uh, spaces like that, even even as we aren't the ones who are always mediating it. Um, for example, uh, how much of myself on 
and I know there was a, someone I really appreciated said that you know I, not every not every technology is related to Facebook, but uh, on Spotify, say when someone gives a recommendation back, how much of myself has been corporate has been mediated via corporate lenses for my entire life, and hence created somehow the performative body you see before you. Uh, I'm curious about how that that conversation um, about the body being mediated by data could be a little more complex and intersect with uh, capitalism. Um, that's my final sentence. Off that same thought, I, in, in the... Um Building off of the idea of Facebook, I guess, I think that there is something to say about the generational relationship to these technologies, that there's, um, say, variation in parenting styles in relationship to these platforms. Therefore, there's now generations of children whose lives are documented on a platform very much outside of their own agency. So whereas we might be able to choose how we opt in and opt out of some of these systems. There will be people whose entire lives from birth are documented on a daily basis. And how does that bleed into what might be um, insurance policies in the future um, when their lives have been documented to such a minute degree? So I appreciate that uh, uh, conversation a lot because earlier you dropped the word hegemony into the room and I think that this is, if I were gonna do anything else in the world, I, I might, but because I think about hegemony and the way in which culture impacts the way we look at ourselves and the way we interact with each other, I'm in this room right now, right? That's why we, why many of us do our, uh, use art and culture as, as a basis for change. Um, and so I, I, part of what um, I wanna, mm, I think maybe that's just a snap, maybe I didn't need the mic, but I just really like um, this idea of our, our bodies and our presence in the world be mediated by what's coming back to us is about the way in which hegemony functions and tells us this is how we are supposed to interact. These are, we're supposed to show off our kids like this. And how are we with the work that we're doing um, using the same, even sometimes the same tools to say, no, actually there's another way to do this. And there's another way to live that's just fine. Um, and, and really unpacking the ways that, um, uh, that the current uh, hegemonic culture makes us, um, truncates our imagination. So this is our uh, sort of penultimate uh, shared breath because we're going to move into the, the outer circle. But just before we do, I just thought maybe we could move out with, Wesley, you mentioned your obsession or keeps you up at night with AI. And I thought while we were moving the chairs out, we could think about sort of building a little bit on, on what the two of you just said. I wonder about how AI plays into this whole question. And also as we're making digital plus performance, I'm trying to bring it all back together. So let's move out into the outer circle and uh, one last big conversation. I just wanted to, I think, yes, AI is one of those things that keeps me up, but it's, I think it's mostly like in all of these systems, whether it be true AI, and I think what was brought up about this idea of data going back to um, experience, but also like data and intuition, which I think, I think you um, talked about it pretty succinctly, um, is still, I think, like the consciousness that goes into it. Because I think there's, there's already this misunderstanding. We have all these algorithms out there. We base a lot of decisions on algorithms. We know it's well, very well documented that these algorithms are very flawed. Um, and we get, depending on what side of privilege you get benefit or you don't get benefit from these flaws. Um, and then also, being able to um, actually defer to the algorithm, right? And so we're hiding behind a lot of these things already, and they haven't even achieved like this idea of consciousness whatsoever. But we're deferring to them actually as decision makers. Um, and so I think even going back to 
um, I don't know, trying to bring it back to performance and thinking about how we're being collected um, through these different platforms and things like that. And thinking about AI, bringing it back to that is like this idea of like simulation and then like the ultimate performance as we perform ourselves, actually that information, when it achieves its utopia, will be able to play us back, you know, and we'll be able to push play on our lives or future lives or iterations of ourselves. Um, and so I just think those things are interesting, interesting when we start to have this conversation. Hello, I'm Charles. Uh, I was really excited when you brought up Skynet. I, uh, I think that that conversation about data is tricky when you think about the platforms and companies and technologies that you're gonna bring into the room and into your work and into your processes. I think that it was a really interesting framing this morning that technology that we're talking about, digital technology, is just the latest innovation in terms of human communication. And so as that process continues, we're talking about it on a human scale today, but if you talk about AI and machine learning, that's a completely different time scale. So if you are bringing voices into the room that are collecting human sensory data, human personal privacy data on a mass scale because you're excited about the innovation to your communication that allows you to reach more people, you may be ethically, like tacitly feeding uh, a process, we talked this morning about labor and changing roles too, you may be undoing your role in the theater. You may be making yourself obsolete in terms of a machine scale of innovation. Yeah, yeah and around the, around the algorithms, um, there's a piece that I'm making right now, which I'll talk a little bit more about on Friday, but part of what we're trying to address in the piece and bring to the consciousness, there's all these studies that say that Americans um, and people in general don't care that their data is being seen. They're like, oh, my data is being seen. I don't care. And they won't take action to protect themselves. They, they don't care enough about privacy. And there are some ways you can ask the question where they do care, but most of the time they don't care. And they won't change their actions uh, because they don't see the dangers of it. But the algorithms are, are, are starting to make decisions that the creators don't understand why the algorithms are making the kind of decisions that they're making. And they're starting to make decisions around whether someone gets insurance or not, or whether an employee has crossed certain lines and you should consider firing them now, or whether um, what criminal sentence someone should receive. These things are starting to be given to these algorithms that are the, the, the most pervasive way that our ourselves are being projected into that space. And so in trying to make the piece, one of the things that we're wrestling with is how do you make something that is trying to address the complexity of this issue, but how do you make it in a way where it stays human and immediate and emotional enough so that you actually can engage people in a different part of themselves so that they can care about this? And that gets to the theater and technology and how you're putting those things together to make it be visceral and impactful. So I think it's a really burning topic right now, certainly. Uh, Still sitting on two chairs. Um, I just, I, I kind of want to, in listening, I want to flag that uh, we keep bringing up this binary of human and technology, and especially digital technology, and that um, I feel like that's, that's a little bit um, irresponsible in a digital performance festival for us to be making such uh, divisions when really we're looking at the intersection and in, in the space between. Um, and especially if we consider that some of the sentiments expressed can be read as prioritizing kind of uh, presence or like in, in person kind of expressions or interactions. Um, and just to go back to my point this morning about being more specific about the kind of language we're using, um, I would say that data is not inherently digital in that um, I think we're talking mostly about big data, which is like large data sets that are computational and algorithmic in nature. Um, because like the Canadian census is data and it's very useful and it's led to some very good things and amazing decisions, but it's not inherently digital. It has been digitized. Um, and yeah, I, and I also just want to, want to hope that we steer back to performance uh, that it's not just engaging with the world of technology, but that it is performance perhaps that is less human-centric or human-centered and maybe doesn't operate on um, understandings of behavior that are inherently just to our own kind. Uh, 
Thanks. Uh, Milton, I was actually just going to um, bring back something you said this morning, hmm. um, and now I'm split because I'm really interested in, the, in, in what the, the critique that you've raised, but I, I think I'd like to go back to something you said this morning because for me, it's an, in, in, a, a very hopeful and um, um, generative use of, uh, of technology and, and the digital plus with respect to being able to look at performance and rehearsal and to uh, to review it on a daily basis, and actually, th that to think as a director about being in control of certain things over a period of time, uh, in an, in that connection with technology, to my mind, that's a way of regaining a sense of presence in the larger um, field of feeling like so much of my presence has maybe been taken away from me in the in the way that I've being created through data and all those sorts of things. So to, to my mind, that was a very interesting response to, uh, to the present world I'm living in, enacted in a process in a rehearsal hall towards an end goal of a show. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder if you could talk, are you working in that way or is that something you just learned about and you're interested in, in doing more of? Um, it's something that uh, had come up as an idea um, in a proposal that uh, we had put forward with the Spiderweb show about um, a, a virtual reality performance lab, and being able to record uh, performance using, using motion capture and being replayed through VR in that we'd be able to witness kind of what is uh, performance again and again, and perhaps that performance doesn't have to be necessarily in the same time zone, which was really a response to the kind of green screen technology, uh, the Spiderweb show in the CDN studio that came out. Uh, if anyone doesn't know that initiative, it's it's to put uh, multiple people in one rehearsal space using green screen technology that's readily available. So green screen, webcam, um, yeah, and that if you want to look at it online, CDN Studio, it's something that Spiderweb Show worked on. Um, so yeah, it's not something that we've uh, put into practice yet, but if we got funding one day, I'd love to. Thank you. And then I would just like to dig in a little bit to uh, your comment about the sort of the, the irresponsible way in which we're talking about technology and humans. And I'm wondering if you could offer another way for us to think about that. I think mm, just generally going back to exploring this kind of gray area, uh, language that uh, assumes uh, that one thing is more valuable than the other. Uh, when inherently, as I can't remember who mentioned it, but we are living in a mediated world. Um, that a lot of things about data have resulted in the things that we use uh, every day, um, and that how we communicate is very much indicative of a time that we live in. Um, and I would even go insofar as to say a concrete example is the way we talk about audiences um, in, in the kind of work that we create, and perhaps that, uh, to go back to one of my earlier points, um, that that's predicated on a certain idea of how to relate to our spectators or people who uh, discuss with us uh, the kind of work that we're making. Um, and I think it's really difficult uh, in this day and age to, to make work uh, that is trying to chase uh, sincerity in many ways, and this is somewhat of an offshoot point, um, and, and kind of discussions through technology when it's still being mediated through, like you have to pay $15 to have this sincere conversation with someone over text message or something, which is a, an amazing kind of gesture, but also I think we have to reckon with this idea of like people are under a model of capitalism and having to pay for the certain thing, and it's all being mediated, mediated through both capital and through a digital uh, kind of platform as well. Thank you. Uh, Alex, we have two minutes left, so. Um, well, it's Alex speaking. I, I, I suppose I want to respond to that because I'm, I'm not sure I entirely agree with the idea that, um, that that we have been speaking in a way that is binary. Or I also think there's a difference between discussing technology um, in an artistic context, context uh, uh, and technology in a non-artistic context. And I know for myself I can say that my relationship with te technology in an artistic context is very much about balance and intersections. But my relationship with technology outside of an artistic context is not that. And, and I am very aware of the divide between what is human and what is um, non-human or what is digital outside of my artistic process. That's the end of my current thought. Thank you. I think that uh, concludes um, our final conversation for the day. Did I miss any last? No? 
I just want to say thank you um, for for that uh, personally. It was um, thrilling and terrifying um, because I always feel like I haven't a clue what I'm talking about, and uh, and and um, I, I feel like I learned a lot. And I want to thank um, all of you for um, for being in this conversation. Um, and I now um, I think I'm going to pass it over to Jamie. Thanks so much, Sarah. Okay, um, so we have a, a pretty hard out right at five, um, but we'd like to uh, spend just a few moments closing out our time together from this day one of conversation, many more days to come. Um, and I think to do that, I would love to ask everyone to think of either a word or a phrase that you have heard today, maybe an image that was spoken today that is uh, sticking with you, that you want to carry forward, that you want to keep thinking about, that you want to chew on over the next few days. Um, and we will just pass the mic around the circle and do that, and then we'll hand it over to Adrian right after that. So I will kick the, so, well, I guess it doesn't matter which way we go. Great, amazing. Okay, so, um, and maybe we say our name one more time since Many of us are staying around for longer than today, and we want to keep getting to know each other. Great. Um, so again, I'm Jamie. Uh, my word is iterative. Uh, I'm Craig, and uh, I guess I'm thinking about the, uh, the immersive versus the interactive. I'm Colleen, and my word, I'm struck by touch. I'm Kristen, and onion. <laughs> uh, Sarah, and fragility. Uh, Miwa, Skynet. Trisha Baldwin, lasting masterpiece versus temporal art. Sophie. Um, Anti-fragile. Mia, agency, consent, and mediated bodies. Abigail, augmented imagination. Charles, and I'm thinking about the movement of the cosmos. Similarly, uh, John, astrophysicist. <laughs> uh, Claude, biological connections. Gata, I'm thinking about the relationship between mastery and magic. Chantal, participation. Roy, do less better. <laughs> David House, co-presence. Wes, performance. Rob, agency. Tristan, uh, serendipity. Alex, uh, the constellations. Sage, mediated intimacy. Uh, Tali, experiment. <laughs> we were talking about that. I don't remember. I don't have one sentence, but um, the history of um, ancestors in relation to um, the history of. Um, Experimentation. Kristen, blue streamers. Catherine, uh, I'd like to keep thinking about this idea of decentering the human. Jenny, same. <laughs> How very queer stars are. <laughs> Wojtek, uh, corpo hegemony disruption. Milton, big data. Wayne, designing uh, collaborations. Xander, um, participation and manipulation. I'm on the anti-fragile uh, kick and also um, re-embodiment. Felicia, uh, we will be able to play our lives back to ourselves. Um, Kevin, um, digital technology is natural phenomena. 
Brenda, I'm also going to go with touch. Kate, and I was thinking about authority, but I can't stop thinking about the word kinder in my head. Or like, what is it? It's like grinder? It's horrifying. Lisa Marie, kids. Adam, uh, data disruption. Andrew, stellar nurseries. Thank you all so much. Um, we will follow up with some emails after this um, that link out to things such as the live stream archive. Um, I believe we've already shared a contact list, but just to say we'll, we'll make sure to do that work so that everyone knows how to find each other after this. Um, and now... I'm over here now. Oh, hello. I know, I move, I move around. Adrian. I'm on pink. Okay, good, I'm on, I'm actually on pink. Oh, you guys had a really nice vibe coming, and then I came in the circle and everything fell over. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much for your time and your, and your focus and, and your brains uh, today. I have a couple small announcements to make. I'm uh, that elf today. First of all, that if you've signed up to view the Electric Company Theater VR session, we're running about 30 minutes behind. So whatever time you signed up for, add 30 minutes. But the meeting point is still the same over here, and we're not going to stop until everybody who signed up has seen the pieces. Um, and if, if that's problematic for you, then come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, the second thing I wanted to share with you is that dinner will be ready for you at 5.15. I think we'll be ending very close to 5 here. However, we do need to clear this space fairly quickly because we're turning it over into a lobby space for an amazing show tonight. I can't tell you how excited I am to have choir, choir, choir uh, come and perform here in Kingston. This is a, a duo who have been doing a, a weekly sing-along, basically, in a bar in Toronto. And uh, it's part comedy, part community singing, part community building. And part of their uh, description of themselves is that you go out into the night feeling great. So if that's not a sales pitch, I don't know what is. And what I'm even more excited about is that we've established our links with our hubs in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Montreal. So at each point, it almost makes me want to cry. In each one of those cities, there's going to be a room full of 30 to 50 people who are also going to be learning Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah in three-part harmony. And at the end of the night, our, we get to sing that together, not just together in our room in this beautiful concert hall here, but with uh, colleagues and friends and family all across the country. So uh, co-presenting, whoever said that over here? Whoever are you? Yes. Um, Dinner is going, thank you, you're good. Uh, dinner is in the Art and Media Lab. So to find the Art and Media Lab, you walk straight towards the stone wall to your left. Uh, there's a sign on the wall that says Art and Media Lab, which will direct you to turn left again at the end of the hallway. You'll pass the restrooms as well as a water fountain. And I think that's the, the last thing, that's my last announcement, but I did want to, uh, I wanted to, insert some mindfulness around how we break this circle. Because uh, we've spent a lot of time building this space and building these relationships, and this is just the beginning of Folda. This is, uh, this is the pre-event, really. This is the tailgate party, and our official launch is tonight, and we will be spending the next couple days together um, to me, what we've done today is conversation starters, and it's given us a chance to see each other's faces, hear some initial thoughts, and know who is out to get us <laughs> or not, <laughs> who we want to get closer to, uh, to continue a conversation and to make contact. So I want to invite you all to stand and create a circle, and I don't know if I'm going to uh, say that we're, I'm going to do the next, uh, yeah, let's just do that one thing at a time. Okay, so we're going to make a circle here together. 
So we're going to be fairly close, and, and let's, let's pick some mindfulness around this and see how perfectly a circle we can make. If we're in a perfect circle, that means you can see everybody. So if you're looking to your right and you can see everybody, that's good. If you're looking to your left, you can see everybody. If you can't see them, you might have to adjust a little bit. You know, I'm short, so I can never see anybody. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, so um, I invite you to look around the circle and see everybody here. Next, I invite you, when I say so, to take a deep breath and let out a, a tone. Whatever sound comes out of your mouth, just, and it might be like, Ugh, which is how I feel, but it might be beautiful, which is, other people might be feeling that. <laughs> We're gonna do that three times, and after the third, when your mute sound is gone, and our group sound is gone, I invite you to just, step away. Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna put this down now so this will not be mic'd. <laughs> 